Question 1. The table shows the probabilities that a biased dice will land on 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6. Well, 1 is missing from the table, but we can work that out. So if we just add all of these ones up, and then let's see what we get. Well, that works out to be 0 0.69 for all of these. So the probability that it would land on a 1 would be 1. So probability of a 1 would be 1 minus 0 0.69. And that would be 0 0.31. So I can put that in here. So Neymar rolls the bias dice 200 times. Work out an estimate for the total number of times the dice will land on a 1 or on a 3. So we would have 0 0.31, lots of those 200 times. That's for landing on a 1. And you can do that on a calculator. So 0 0.31 times 200. That's 62 times. And for landing on a 3, well, we're given that already. That's 0 0.18 times 200, which is going to be 0.18 times 200. I don't know why I'm using the calculator. I do know what the answer is, but hey, 36. So the total number of times landing on a 1 or 3 would be 62 and 36 so that would be 98 times. Question 2. On Saturday it says some adults and some children were in the theatre. The ratio of the number of adults to children is 5 to 2. It says each person had a seat in the circle or had a seat in the stalls. So we've got adults and children and we've got the circle or the stalls so it says three quarters of the children had seats in the stalls okay so that's three quarters of all the children so that means a quarter would be in the circle 117 children had seats in the circle. So that means if a quarter of the children is 117, then that means all of the children, i.e. four quarters, would be four lots of 117. You can do that on your calculator. That would be 468 children altogether. But it says here that there are exactly 2,600 seats in the theatre. Well, we have our ratio here. So if there's 468 children, we can work out how many adults there are going to be. Because if we make this ratio a little simpler, so say we say adults to children is 5 to 2, then if we divide both sides by 2, then we have 5 over 2 to 1. Now, that 1 represents 468 children. So if we times that by 5 over 2, or 2.5, so let's do that. So 468 times 2.5, that's 1,170 adults. So the next thing to look at is if we know how many adults and children there were at the theatre, we can add those together. So 1,170 and 468. That's 1,638 people in total. And we've got to work out were 60% of the seats taken on that Saturday? Well, there's 2,600 seats in the theatre. So 60% of 2,600, we can just times 2,600. 
by 0.6 is the quickest way of doing it on the calculator and that is 1560. Well, we've worked out that there were 1638 people in total. So, yes, more than 60%. Excuse me, more than 60% of seats were taken. Question 3. The diagram shows a prism with a cross section in the shape of a trapezium and on the grid below we have to draw the front elevation and the side elevation of the prism using a scale of 2 centimetres to 1 metre. Well if you want to look at the front elevation first then we've got to be 2 metres high so 2 metres that would be 4 centimetres so 1, 2, 3, 4, so that will be the first part here. Then we want to have 2 metres for the base, so 1, 2, 3, 4, and then half a metre. Well, if 1 metre is 2 centimetres, this will be 1 centimetre, and then we join these up with a ruler. Your diagram will be a lot better than mine, and we'll label that as front. Then... The side elevation, well the base is 1 metre, so 1 metre is 2 centimetres. And then the height here is half a metre, which is 1 centimetre. And then this part we've got to draw as a, a thick line. And then you've got to be careful here, because to show um, the slant part, You've got to think, well, this is half a metre, so half a metre off two metres is one and a half metres, which would be three centimetres. So this goes up by three. One, two, three, like so. OK, and then we can label this as side. Question four. Ollie drove 56 kilometres from Liverpool to Manchester... So that's 56 kilometres. And he then drove 61 kilometres from Manchester to Sheffield. On his average speed from Liverpool to Manchester was 70 kilometres per hour. Well, we know speed is distance per unit of time. So what are we given for this first part here? Well, we're definitely given the distance and we're given the average speed, so we can work out the time. So we can reorganise or rearrange this equation here. So speed equals distance over time, and we want to find time on its own. What we can do is we can times both sides by t, and that means we'd get st equals um, d here, and then we can divide both sides by s, and that will give us t equals d over s. So our time is the distance over the average speed, which is 70. And on your calculator, um, you can use that if you wish. I'm going to try and do it without, just for practice. So divide that by um, 7 is 8, and divide that by 7 is 10. So 8 tenths, that's 0 0.8. So that's 0 0.8 hours. Well, now we can work out the last part of the question and that is work out Ollie's average speed for his total drive. So we want the total distance. So the distance will be 56 plus 61 which is 117 kilometers and we need to know the total time it took. So we worked out we had 0 0.8 hours and then we had 1.25 because 75 minutes is 1 hour and 15 minutes, and 15 minutes is quarter of an hour. So the total time is going to be um, 0.8 plus 1.25. And the reason is, don't forget, it's kilometres per hour, not kilometres per minute or kilometres per second. It's hours we need to have it in. So that's going to be 2.05 
hours. So now we can work out our average speed. So that's going to be distance, that's 117 over 2.05. And let's see what that gives on the calculator. 117 divided by 2.05. And I'll write that all down. That's 57.07317 recurring. So, you know, around 57 kilometres um, per hour is absolutely fine. We can give that as our answer. So for part B of this question, if Janie is correct, and what does this tell you about the two parts of Janie's journey... Um, and looking at the information, um, Janie's average speed from Barsley to Leeds was 80 kilometres an hour um, and her average speed from Leeds to York was 60 kilometres an hour. For her assumption saying that, oh, I can just take the average of um, the mean, sorry, of 80 kilometres and 60 kilometres um, to find the average speed, either the time taken from Barsley to Leeds and Leeds to York would have to be exactly the same, or the distance from Barnsley to Leeds compared to Leeds to York would have to be taken in the ratio of their average speeds, 60 to 80, which would basically boil down as three quarters to one. In other words, the distance from Barnsley to Leeds would have to be three quarters of the distance from Leeds to York. Question five. A, B, C and EDC are straight lines, and we're told that EA is parallel to DB, and we're given some measurements, and we have to work out the length of A to E. Well, a nice way of doing this type of question is to draw the two triangles that make up this um, shape. So here would be my first one. That's the larger one, E, A, C, and then separately draw the smaller one, and that's the common point C, B, and D. Now, the important thing to the important thing to recognise here is that from our original diagram, and I'll just draw a little bit of this in for you to help is if we produce these parallel lines here, then this point is common to both triangles, so this angle here must equal this angle here. And then this angle here, well, that must correspond to this angle here. And if you think about it, I can draw this parallel line closer and closer and closer so eventually this point would correspond to this point here because this parallel line would eventually become the line going through AE. So we know in our diagram therefore that this angle here is the same as this angle here which only leaves this angle here to be the same as this one because two of them are already the same. So the important thing about this is is to understand that AE corresponds to BD by some scale factor of enlargement just like AC corresponds to BC by the same scale factor and EC to DC and likewise. So we're given some measurements. EC is 8.1 centimeters. DC is 5.4. Now that's useful already. And DB is 2.6. Now this was very useful because that's like 81 and 54 and I've noticed that 9 goes into both of those but if that doesn't really do it for you then you can say to yourself right how do I get from one to the other? Well let's look at getting from the smaller one 5.4 to the larger one. And this can represent your scale factor. <clears throat> so 5.4 times what is 8.1? You can use your calculator, divide both sides by 
um, 5.4. And the reason I like this is because if you divide this by 9, you'll get um, 0.9. And if you divide this by 9, you'll get 0.6. And 0.9 divided by 0.6 on your calculator or in your head, 9 sixes is 3 over 2, so it's 1.5. So you'd get the scale factor, which is represented by this little box I did here. Your scale factor would be 3 over 2, or if you want the decimal, um, 1.5. So how does that help us find AE? Well, the nice thing is you're given 2.6 here, and we already know that this corresponds by the scale factor 1.5. 1.5 times bigger, because in your original, this one is smaller than this one. So we know that AE must be 2.6 times the same scale factor as we had before. So 2.6 times 1.5, and that is 3.9. So that would be 3.9 centimetres. It now tells us that AC is 6.15 and we have to work out the length of AB. Now, to do this one here, we don't have to worry too much. It wants this length from here to here, so we don't have to worry. We can find this one really quickly, because it's going from, well, AC is a bigger side to a smaller one, so we divide by 1.5. So if we do 6.15 divided by 1.5, then that would make BC 4.1. So we better show our workings. So 6.15 divided by 1.5 equals BC. If you don't like that, you can say BC times 1.5 is 6.15, and you'll get the same answer. So we know that B to C is 4.1, which your calculator can show you quite easily. So we can work out AB, because if we knew that AC was 6.15 and BC is 4.1, we just take them away from each other. So we can have AB is 6.15 subtract 4.1. So 6.15 minus 4.1, and my calculator gives me 2.05. So AB is 2.05 centimetres. Question 6. Anil wants to invest £25,000 for three years in a bank. And we've got to work out whether personal bank or secure bank is the best one. Anna wants the most interest at the end of the three years, and I've got to show all the working, of course. Right, so let's start with the £25,000 going in, and let's have a look at the compound interest at 2% for each year. Well, we'd have to times that by 1.02, which basically times it by the 1, which is the whole amount, and then also adds on, look at it like that, and adds on the 2% as well, okay? Because 1 plus 0.02 is the same as 1.02. So we can do that on the calculator. So we need to do that three times. So we can do um, 1.02 to the power 3, we want to show all our workings, so we're going to use this multiplier here, and I'm just going to times that by 25,000 on my calculator, and that would give me £26,530.20, and then I'm just going to take away the 25,000 because I just want the interest. And that's going to be £1,530.20 altogether. The second way would be to take the £25,000 
and we want 4.3% for the first year, so 1.043, and then 0.09, see I almost made a mistake there, this is quite tricky, 0.9%, well if you think as 9% would be 0.09, then 0.9% would be 0 0.009, so I nearly made a mistake there. And we've got to do that for every extra year, so there's three years in total, so that will be squared. So let's have a look at what that gives. So we'd have 1.009 to the power 2 times by 1.043 and that gives a multiplier of 1.0618 so what you could argue is is that this multiplier here is actually more than this one so you're going to get more interest in secure bank and then just state your answer but i guess a lot of you wouldn't want to do that in the exam for some reason um, it's probably confidence, and times that by 25,000, and that would be 26,546, right, now this is 0.46, so that's to the nearest pound, to the nearest penny, sorry. So if we do take 25,000 away from that, that would give us a net interest of £1,546.46 and that's to the nearest penny so this one so you would just write secure bank um, gives the most interest so that's how I would um, do this question. Question 7. A number n is rounded to two decimal places. The result is 4.76. So that's to two decimal places. Now, what that means is it's correct to the nearest 0 0.01, which is the nearest 100th. And a good way of working these out is, if you look at it like a balance, if you take the 0 0.01 and you split it into halves, into half of the amount, you'll get 0 0.005 one side and 0 0.005 the other. Now, I always like doing that when you round something to one decimal place or two decimal places or one significant figure for example you could always cut what you've rounded it to into halves and then you can add 0 0.005 to make it the upper bound and you can take 0 0.005 to make it the lower bound so what we'll look at is we can say that using inequalities write down the error interval for n well if we write n this way, what's the most it can be? Well, if we add 0 0.005, we'd get 4.765. Now, it couldn't quite be exactly that, could it? Because the 5 would round this 6 to a 7. So we'd have to say anything approaching 4.765, i.e. 4.765. 4, 9, 9, and so on. So it can't be less than or equal to, so we'll just put less than. So that can be any number approaching 4.765 but not equaling it. However, if we take 0 0.005 away from 4.76, and you can do that on your calculator if you're not sure, you'll get the lower bound is 4.755. So it could be that because that would round to 4.76. So we would have less than or equal sign here. So when you're reading the inequality, if you look at this first, it means 4.755 can be less than or equal to n, which means that n is greater than or equal to it. 
or n is just less than 4.765. So that's the best way of writing the inequality that shows the bounds for n. Question 8. The cumulative frequency graph shows some information about the heights in centimetres of 60 students. We have to work out an estimate for the number of these students with a height greater than 160 centimetres. So in your exam you would carefully use your ruler and draw a nice dotted line reaching the graph, the curve. And then we'll read across. So looking at my graph here. I can see that we're on the 48 mark. So it says the students with a height greater than 160 centimetres, so that would just leave 2 and 10 more, so that would be um, 12 students in total. And that would be the answer. Question 9. The diagram shows a triangle A drawn on the grid and Kyle reflects the triangle A in the x-axis to get triangle B. Well, let's have a look at this. The x-axis here, so that's going to be our mirror. So triangle B, and you'd use a ruler in the exam obviously. There we go, that's triangle B. He then reflects triangle B in the line y equals x, and I've already put that line on there for you. So that's the line y equals x. And that's got to be reflected in the line y equals x to get triangle C. So one way of doing that is to look at the coordinates here. So if that's 4 along and 1 down, if you want to reflect it in the line y equals x, then y becomes x because y equals x. It's a reflection. So you can just change the coordinates around to have negative 1, 4. So negative 1, 4. This one will be 4, negative 3, so that becomes negative 3, 4 by swapping them around. And here, 3 along, 3 down becomes going along 3 first and then up 3. Because, just to recap, if that was 3, negative 3, if you want to reflect it in the line y equals x, you swap these around. And then we have the point negative 3, 3 instead. So we can join that up to form a triangle, and that is Kyle's triangle C. Amy reflects triangle A in the line y equals x to get triangle D. So, let's have a look. So this point will stay the same. This point, you don't really need to use the coordinate method, you can just see by I here that we're going to have that point there. And then this point you can try, so that would be 4, 4 along, 1 up. So that just becomes 1, 4. OK, so here's our reflection. And Amy calls that triangle D. She is then going to reflect triangle D in the x-axis to get triangle E. Well, let's have a look. Well, this point here is 1, 2, 3 away from the mirror, so 1, 2, 3, so that corresponds to this point. This point is going to be 1 further away, and then this point here is 1, 2, 3, 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4. So there we have it, and that is triangle E. And Amy says that triangle E should be in the same position as triangle C. Is Amy correct? Well, no. And you can just say C diagram. What we could actually see here is the comparison between E and C is um, such that you can see there's a rotation going on here. OK, so you can watch carefully here. There's a rotation from E to C. I'll just let that play for a little bit. And if you look at the diagram, when it goes through A, you can see that to get from A to C is an anti-clockwise rotation of 90 degrees. And likewise, the other way around, you can see it, if I can just get this diagram to 
and work. Let's have a look. And if you want to go from A to E, then you can see it's a clockwise rotation. Okay, so that's a bit too much um, emphasis here on why it's not the right answer. I think if you just show your diagrams, clearly label them, then you're going to get full marks. But I just wanted you to see how C and E differed from each other. Question 10. The table shows some information about eight planets. It says write down the name of the planet with the greatest mass. Well, the highest um, power of 10 here is 10 to the 27. So that would be Jupiter in this case. Find the difference between the mass of Venus and the mass of Mercury. So we've got 4.869 times 10 to the 24 minus 3.302 times 10 to the 23. And I'm going to give that in standard form, although it doesn't say. So I'm going to put that on the calculator quickly. And that gives me 4.5388 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Nishat says that Neptune is over 100 times further away from Earth than Venus is. Is Nishat right? You must show how you get your answer. Well, let's have a look. So Neptune is 4.35 times 10 to the 9 kilometres away from Earth. So that's Neptune. And Venus is 4.14 times 10 to the 7 kilometres away from Earth. So she says that Neptune is over a hundred times further away from Earth than Venus is. Well, if we take the distance that Venus is away and we times it by a hundred, or 10 to the power 2, that would give us 4.14 times 10 to the 9. Well, Neptune is clearly 4.35 times 10 to the 9 kilometres away, and 100 times more than what Venus was, was only 4.14 times 10 to the 9. So is Nishat right? I would say yes, Nishat is correct. Question 11. We have to solve this equation, which may look worrying to some. first thing to notice, and I said this in a different question on this um, year's papers, is to put a bracket around this to help you remember not to get stuck here. Okay, So I think the first thing I would look at is how can I get rid of these ugly denominators here, 4, 3 and 6. Well I know if I times both sides by 12 that will help me a great deal. So if I times this by 12, this by 12, and this one by 12. So I've times this entire side by 12 altogether, and I've done exactly the same to this side because it's a balance, it's an equation. Then I can cancel, and I would have 12 divided by 4, that would be 3. I'd have 12 divided by 3, that would be 4, and I'd have 12 divided by 6, and that would be 2. So my next line of working would be 3 lots of 3x minus 2 minus 4 lots of 2x plus 5. That's why these brackets were quite useful. Equals 2 lots of 1 minus x. I'm now going to expand these. So that's 9x minus 6 minus 8x minus 20 equals 2 minus 2x. I'm going to collect the like terms together here. So that's going to be x minus 26 equals 2 minus 2x. I'm going to add 2x to both sides here. And 
and I'm going to add 26 to both sides. Now, if I have 3x equals 28, then all I have to do is divide both sides by 3. Let's make that a little bit neater, actually. So I have to divide both sides by 3. And that would give me x equals 28 thirds or 28 divided by 3. And I would leave it as that. Question 12. There are 30 students in Mr Lear's class. 16 of the students are boys. Two students from the class are chosen at random. And Mr Lear draws this probability tree diagram for this information. We have to write down one thing that is wrong with the probabilities in the probability tree diagram. Well, if two students from the class are chosen at random, then if the first student is chosen, then I agree that could be 16 out of 30. But there's definitely something wrong here. Because if one of the students that is chosen is a boy, that would mean there'd only be 29 students left to choose from. So the first thing that we can say is, and I've written it, the denominators for the second student are wrong. Another thing I've noticed is that the probabilities should sum to 1, and they don't, and they both sum to 29 thirtieths. And I've written that there for you as well. The sum of the probabilities for the second student don't sum to 1. And I'm talking about um, dependent on the first choice, obviously. So either just these two or just these two fractions here should sum to 1. The next part says that Owen and Wasim play for the school football team. The probability that Owen will score a goal in the next match is 0.4, the probability that Wasim will score a goal in the next match is 0.25. And we've got to look at um, what Mr Slater says, and that is the probability that both boys will score a goal in the next match is the sum of these probabilities. And we've got to say, is Mr Slater right? Well, let's have a look at a simple tree diagram. So this can be for Owen, and this can be for Wasim. And Owen's scoring would be 0 0.4, and so not scoring would be 0 0.6. And then for Wasim, Owen could score, and Wasim, it says the probability of him scoring is 0 0.25, and for him not scoring would be 0 0.75. However, Owen could have not scored his first, and Wasim could have gone on to score, which is 0 0.25, and not scoring, make myself a bit more room here, and not scoring again, 0 0.75. So the probability of them both scoring, you follow the rules of the probability tree, and here we have to multiply the outcomes. And the way I've explained this in the past is if, and you can fast forward this if you already know how to do this, if you had, for example, um, 100, um, let's say 120 cars, let's say here. I've got to find a number that works nicely. If 40% of those 120 cars turned um, this route, then we would have 48 cars. And that would leave us with 72 cars turning down to this route. But then... A quarter, it says, of these cars would have to turn this way, I left. So a quarter of 48 would be 12, which would leave 36 here. And then a quarter of this 72 cars would turn left here. And you would have 18 and then 54. But the point I'm trying to make is how do we get the number 12 as opposed to 120? Well, that's why we times 0 0.4 by 0 0.25. And this is 4 tenths multiplied by 1 quarter. And you can see that simply leaves you with 1 tenth. And the nice thing about 1 tenth is that that's the link between where we started with the 120 cars and where we ended up with 12. But if you already know about multiplying with probabilities, with probability tree diagrams, and that's absolutely fine. You can miss this part out. 
So I've put my um, reason in here, no, and there's my reason. Question 13. The histogram shows some information about the ages of the 134 members of a sports club. We're told that 20% of the members of the sports club who are, over, who are over 50 years of age are female. Work out an estimate for the number of female members who are over the age of 50. Well, let's have a look a little bit more closely here so we can see. If we label 50 here, we can see that if we want to find the area of this part of the bar, that would represent the number of women in that particular bar. So we've got this area to find first. And we can see that that represents a base of 10 and a height of, well, this goes up in point, um, I think it's point 0.1, so 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, and so on. So this would be 10 times 1.4. And then we'd like to find the area of this one, which is from 60 to 90, so that is 30 lots of, and we've got 0 0.5, 0 0.6, that would be 0 0.7. So without too much calculation, that's going to be 14, and that's going to be 21. So that's a total of 35 people, and the question clearly wanted 20%, um, it said, 20% of the members who are over 50 years of age are female. Work out an estimate for the number of female members who are over 50 years of age. Well, that's just going to be 20% of that amount. So 20% of 35, well, that's just going to be easily done with a calculator. That can be 20 divided by 100 times 35, or 0 0.2 times 35 on your calculator. Either way, it's going to give you um, seven women. Question 14. We've got some graphs and we have to match them up with the equations. Well, let's have a look at this one first. Um, y equals 2 to the power of x. Well, if x is 0, 2 to the power of 0 is 1. So we're looking through for one of these that will go through 1 potentially. And this one's a potential, and so is this one. Um, and it could be this one. I can't see any others that intersect at a value not 0. And then also, as x increases, then y increases. So if x is 1, we would have 2 to the power 1, which is 2. If x is 2, we'd have 2 to the power 2, which is 4. So this doubles each time. So we're looking for a shape that has something like so. Now, this one definitely seems to work out. Um, this one doesn't, so we can rule that one out. And we can rule this one out. So we're going to say that this one is graph A. Now let's have a look at y equals 4 over x. Well, if x was 0, then 4 divided by 0, that, would be not, that wouldn't be defined. So we're looking for a graph here that has something strange happening at 0. Well, this one has something strange happening at 0, and so does this one. The rest seem to be OK. So it's either B or H. But we know that when X increases, then 4 divided by something that increases decreases. So... For, and this is for x being nice, whole, positive numbers. So this one here seems to do the trick. So it starts out, for example, when x is 1, we have y is 4. When x is 2, we have y is 2. When x is um, 4, we'd have y is 1. And then likewise, if we had x was a half, 4 divided by a half is 8. So if I had a half here, then it's going up to 8 and so on. So it's definitely going to be h. Now, y equals sine x. Well, I don't know if you know too much about the trigonometric um, ratios and the graphs of sine and cosine, 
but if you know the unit circle, even if you don't know the unit circle, you should know that the sine of zero, when there's no angle here, is actually zero itself. So I'll just draw that in. And if the angle is 90, the sine of 90 is one. So in this case, you could think it's this graph or this one. But if we know the sine of zero is zero, then the sine of 90 is one, and that's where that would be, and this would be the angle. So we know that it's going to be C for this one. This happens to be the graph of cosine x. That leaves us with trying to find a cubic now. And the best way I would do for this one is to firstly get rid of the ones we've already got. So we're going to get rid of C here, we're going to get rid of A, and we're going to get rid of H. Well, let's see what we know about y equals x cubed plus 4x. Well, we could factorise this, and that would be x squared plus 4. And that's interesting because we know that when x is 0, we would have 0 times um, 4 in here, which is in itself 0. So we know this one crosses at 0. So we can get rid of this one, and we can definitely get rid of this one. And it just leaves these two in here. Well, what I would personally do is I would just put in um, a number like x equals 1, for example. And that would give me 1 lots of 1 plus 4, which is 1 lot of 5, which is 5. So if x is 1, we have 5, and that would be fine for this one. But it certainly wouldn't be up here for this one. In fact, it would be down here. And you might also know from being taught at school that the cubic has this type of um, shape also. But just be very careful that you can try and eliminate the ones you definitely know it isn't. Question 15. A, B, C and D are four points on the circumference of a circle. And A, E, C and B, E, D are straight lines. Okay, so... This is a straight line here and a straight line here. We've got to prove that triangle ABE and DCE are similar. We must give our reasons. So we're going to be careful here because we've got to show our reasoning carefully. So the first thing I've noticed is that if we're looking in this triangle here and this triangle here, then First of all, we know that this angle here is the same as this angle here. So we can say that angle A, E, B is the same as angle D, E, C. And that's because they are opposite angles. We also know that this angle here is the same as this angle here because we've got a chord here which splits the whole circle into a minor segment and a major segment and angles in the same segment are equal. So DCA must equal DBA. So what do we write as our reason? And there's my explanation, because angles in the same segment are equal. Angle ABD is the same as angle DCA. Now, that would mean that by default, that the third angle would be um, the same, because the triangle already has two angles which have been taken, so the third one must be equal. If you don't like that, then you can just repeat the same idea. This chord splits this into a minor and a major segment. So you can also see here that angle B, A, C is the same as angle B, D, C for the same reason. So I've given that reason there. It's the same as before. So we can then say that each triangle has identical corresponding angles. So one must be an enlargement of each other. So either they're exactly the same, congruent, or they are similar. Try and look at the similarity also as being a scale factor enlargement and congruency as being a scale factor enlargement of one. So they don't change. So that's that question done. Question 16. 
It says using algebra, let's prove that point 1, 3, 6 recurring times point 2 recurring is equal in value to 1 33rd. Well, if we let x equal 0.136 recurring, then we can, as I'm sure you know, we can start playing around with um, both sides by timesing by um, powers of 10 until we get something nice. So if we times both sides by 10, we'd get 1 point and then the 3, 6 recurring part. If we times it by 10 again, we'd get 13.6, and then don't forget the 3 would follow here because it's 6, 3 recurring. This goes on and on, don't forget. Okay, so then what we can do is we can times it by 10 again and get 136.36 recurring. Now the key is, is to look for where you can take away and get rid of the recurring part. That's the whole idea. So if we look at 1000x minus 10x, that would give 990x. And then if we do the 136 take away the 1, because don't forget these parts will cancel off, we'll get 135. And that is nice. So x is 135 990ths. And your calculator um, may be able to um, cancel that down for you. So I don't have mine at hand right now. So if you divide both sides, top and bottom, by 5, you'll get 27. And if you divide the bottom part by 5, you'll get 180, 198, I think. And then you can divide the top by 3. And um, let's have a look. I think you can divide the top by 9. So you could have... Um, 3 here and 198 divided by 9 will be 22. So I think that's 320 seconds. Then if you let y equal 0 0.2 recurring, which you probably should know as 2 ninths anyway, but if you don't, you can do it in the same way. Times both sides by 10. And then you see if you do 10 y take away y, do the same to both sides, you'd have 9y equals 2, so y would be 2 ninths. So what we want to show is, is 3 20 seconds multiplied by 2 ninths, does that give 1 33rd? So if we call z 133rd, that's what we've got to try and find. So don't forget we're timesing here, we're not adding. So these would cancel through nicely to give 1 11th. This would cancel through nicely. And so we'd have 1 11th times 1 3rd, which equals 1 33rd, which is the same as z. So we have shown that 0.136 recurring times 0.2 recurring is equal in value to 1 33rd. Question 17. We're given a sector ONQ. We're given some information about it. So we're given that the, the radius here, if it was a circle, would be 11. We're also given that OAB is equilateral, and we're told that these are 7 centimetres each. Well, we're not told they're all seven, we're just told it's equilateral, we can work out that they're all seven, and because it's equilateral we can work this angle out to be 60 degrees. So to me it's quite a simple job of finding the area of the sector, the area of the triangle, and then taking them away from each other. So the area of the sector is going to be 60 out of 360 times what the area of the large circle would have been. So that would be 6360ths of pi r squared, and we know how to do that. And then the area of the triangle, don't forget when you've got um, a triangle, and especially um, in this case it's equilateral, so you could actually do it by right angle trig if you wanted, because you still know enough information here. You know that 7 over 2 
and this is 7, so you could find that angle, which is 30, and then work out all the missing lengths um, to find out the area. Don't forget to find the area. You'd need to know the base times this missing length here, which you could do by Pythagoras. But if you know the area of a triangle formula, a half times A times B times the sine of the angle, I think it's sometimes known as a half times A times B times sine C, then this would be the angle, and A and B are the lengths that make up that angle. Okay, so we can put that in, so we can say a half times A, which is 7, times B, which is 7 again, because it's equilateral, times the sine of um, 60. Now, you don't have to know the sine of 60 um, right this minute, because you've got the calculator, but you have to know it for other parts of the exam. And the sine of 60 is the cosine of 30, which is root 3 over 2. This part will be 49, and this denominator here of 2 stays there. So, you can do this on the calculator if you want, but I'm just going to try and work through from here. So I've got pi times 121, or 121 pi. 60 out of 360 is 1 6. So that's the area of the sector. And we're going to take away 49 root 3 over 4 away from here. So putting this into the calculator now, and I'm going to do each part at a time. So 121 pi divided by 6, well that gives me 63.3554185 and now I'm just going to give myself a bit more room. I'm going to put this part on the calculator now, so 49 divided by 4 times root 3 and that gives me 21.2176239 you could have just left it in a simplified form which I'm not going to go into now but let's have a look so we've got this part so I can put that on the calculator so I'm going to just calculate that quickly and I get 42 Point one three seven eight two nine four six. That's all the decimals on my calculator. Now, that's going to be in centimeter squares. But we want to calculate the area of the shaded region as a percentage of the area of ONQ. Well, all we have to do here is take um, the decimals that we've already got, use our calculator, and change into a percentage. So we've got our numerator here, which we've just written down. What fraction of the whole part, so the whole sector we've got as well, which was 63.3554185. I'm going to decimalize um, that now. So let's have a look, 355. And I get 0. 6651018693 and if i want to change that into a percentage then then i think you can see that will be 66.5101869 we want it here in the question it wants it to one decimal place so i think we can see that we're going to have 66.5% to one decimal place. So don't forget, you could have just worked through with all of this in terms of um, non-decimals, and then you would have had a non-decimal here and a non-decimal here, and you could have put it all into your calculator using proper um, brackets around everything, um, and you would have got the same answer. But it doesn't hurt to use the calculator um, for speed in this particular question. Question 18. We have 16 to the power of fifth, or the fifth root of 16, times 2 to the power of x, x is what we want to find, equals 8 to the power of 3 quarters. Well, I think this is quite a difficult question, because you've got plenty of choices, and it's about making the best choices here. Um, 
you can either get every base to be the number two, which is nice, or you can make every base four or eight or 16, any power of two will be fine. But try and stick with something nice and easy. Okay, so let's stick with two. So what you have to say to yourself is, can I make 16 out of 2 to the power of something? Well, yes, you can, because it's 2 to the power of 4. And then the 1 fifth is there waiting for us. The next part, don't need to change. 8, how can I make that as powers of 2? Well, it's 2 to the power of 3. Then notice you have to use your rules of indices, where if you have a to the bc, that's the same as a to the b to the power c. So you multiply b and c together. Don't confuse that with a to the b times a to the c. That's different. So in this case, you will have 2 to the power 4 fifths times 2 to the power x equals 2 to the power, well be careful, 3, look at that as 3 whole ones, 3 whole ones times 3 quarters is 9 quarters. Now we can use the other rule of indices. We can either do it that way by adding 4 fifths to x, or we can divide both sides by 4 fifths. So I personally would just go ahead and just add the powers. So I would then have 2 to the power x plus 4 fifths equals 2 to the power 9 quarters. And what that must mean is that x plus 4 fifths has to be equal to 9 quarters to make this balance. The alternative here was to divide both sides by this quantity here and you would be left with 2 to the x equals 2 to the 9 quarters divided by 2 to the 4 fifths. And I hope you can appreciate then that would give you 2 to the x equals 2 to the 9 quarters minus 4 fifths. And that would indeed give you the same as what we've got here. So sticking with the way we went, What that means is we'd have x plus 4 fifths equals 9 quarters. So take 4 fifths on both sides and we'd have 9 quarters minus 4 fifths, which is going to be, well, 45 minus 16 over 20. 45 minus 16, this is a calculator paper. So if you're struggling with 45 minus 16 under pressure, then don't worry. So you've got 29 twentieths. So that would be your answer um, for x. Just having a look at the mark scheme, um, for those that are worried, then you can just write that as a decimal because your method may have lent itself better to decimals. And of course, 29 over 20 is 14.5 over 10, which is 1.45. Don't worry, that's absolutely fine also. One thing I would stress is, maybe try the question in a different way. Maybe get all of them in terms of um, fours. And I'll just start you off quickly on this one. So 16 is 4 squared to the fifth a bit more room here and then 2 well how is that in terms of um, powers of 4 well that's the square root of 4 so that's 4 to the half to the x and then what is 8 in terms of powers of 4 well 4 to the power of a half is 2 cubed is 8. Okay, 
Now, obviously, this is much more complicated, but I just want to show you that you can choose any base you want as long as it's a multiple of two. So it's quite good practice for your indices. So if you want to carry that um, one forward, you're going to get the same answer for x. Okay, And I do strongly suggest, especially if you're wishing to go on to A level, to be very good at doing it in any type of base. Question 19. We've got rather a complex expression here and we've got to show that this expression can be written in this form like so. Well the first thing that might worry some students is well should there not be brackets involved in this question because if you put a bracket here and here. This would help you realise not to make the dreadful error of not timesing through properly and getting the right sign, especially here where this is really a 1 here and you've got negative 1 multiplied by negative 6 to give 6, not negative 6. So be very careful and understand what this actually means. Okay, So we've got to get it in the form ax plus b, some linear form here, over x squared minus 9. So the first thing that I would do is realise that we've got a difference of two squares going on here. And that's good because that does relate um, to the question already. So let's get on with the question then. So the first thing I would do is... I would start trying to make the denominators um, match up here. So I can definitely times this 2 here, top and bottom, by x squared minus 9. And that doesn't change its value because x squared minus 9 divided by x squared minus 9 is just 1. And then I can times this middle part of the expression, top and bottom, by x plus 3. So if I times the bottom by x plus 3, then we know that we've got another x squared minus 9 waiting for us. And then for the last part, let's just make some room here. And so for the last part, we times top and bottom by x minus 3. And that also would give us x squared minus 9. So what I can have now is I can have a common denominator of x squared minus 9 which is just what I needed and all I have to do now is be very careful with my multiplication. So I'm going to just extend this um, line here so be careful with my multiplication with brackets i.e. my expanding. So I'll do this in this way to help people understand it a bit better. So 2x squared minus 18 and then what I would do here is put a minus sign here and put a square bracket and then just do this as if the negative sign wasn't there. So I'd have x squared then 3x and 2x is 5x plus 6 again multiply these out. So I'd have an imagine as if the minus sign wasn't there because it just make it easier for you. x squared minus 3x minus 6 more that's minus 9x plus 18. Now we're going to get to the answer reasonably quickly now. So let's have a look. So we just look at this part here. And all we've got to do now is just be careful on our um, variables here and see that we've got them all right. So we're lucky here because we've got 2x squared minus x squared minus another x squared. So that's 0. I've got negative 18, which I'm just going to put here. And then I've got minus 5x. 
minus 6 plus 9x minus 18 all over x squared minus 9. Now don't forget the question, it wanted it in the form, let's have a quick look, it wanted it in the form ax plus b over x squared minus 9. So, let's do the x's first. 9x minus 5x is 4x. Negative 18 uh, minus 18 more is minus 36. Minus 6 is minus 42 over x squared minus 9. So that would be my final answer. And I'll just put these here. A is 4, B is negative 42. Question 20. The diagram shows part of the graph of y equals x squared minus 2x plus 3. By drawing a suitable straight line, we need to use the graph to find estimates for the solutions to this equation here x squared minus 3x minus 1 equals 0. Well, let's do a comparison now. If we started here and we added 4 to both sides, we would end up with x squared minus 3x plus 3 equals 4. Well, these two match now, so we've got part of the way there. What we can now do is, if we add x to both sides, then we'd end up with x squared minus 2x plus 3 equals x plus 4. So, the nice thing about this question is, we already have this part drawn for us. So if we actually draw the line y equals x plus 4, that would be exactly the same as solving this equation here. Don't forget we're just estimating, okay? And that's why this graphical technique can work. So let's try and graph y equals x plus 4. So I've drawn that on the graph, so we can label that y equals x plus 4. And let's now estimate. So this one crosses here, and you'd use your ruler in an exam, and you'd definitely show this dotted line here. So that looks like 3.2, about 3.3. So we can say x is roughly 3.3. Um, or here, and we can go down with the ruler here and draw a dotted line. And this is 1, don't forget, so it's 0 0.2, 0 0.4, about 0 0.3. And that's negative. Now in the exam, you'd have some leeway um, for accuracy. So... Um, if you didn't get exactly the same answer as me, that's absolutely fine. I think this one can be between 3.2 and 3.4. This one here between negative 0.2 and negative 0.4. Let's move on to the next part. It says in the next part that P is the point on the graph y equals x squared minus 2x plus 3, which is shown where x equals 2. Well, let's draw that on here. So there's P. And here's our point x equals 2. So we need to read along and we're here. We need to put a tangent at p and it's the gradient of that tangent. And don't forget, the tangent will only cross at p. So we need to make sure we place it as best as we can by using our eye. Um, we don't have any other equipment that we can use apart from a ruler and a pencil. Um, so let's have a go at drawing this in. And I'll try and do this um, with what I've got and see if I make a mess of it. So let's change the colour. And there's my straight line and I'm just going to try and as best as I can align this so it just touches the curve at P only as best as I can. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and calculate the gradient of that line because it's the same on the entire straight line. Um, of course, this is, if anyone wants to know, this is all about differentiation and rates of change, but I'm not going to go into all of that now. This is the actual uh, machinery involved in how to do this question. We just need to find the gradient of the line. 
So a good place to start, I believe, would be from a point we know. And if I read along two units, I'm going up by um, one, two, three, four units. Okay, because I'm starting from three and I'm going up to seven. So the gradient, if I go along two and up four, that's the same as going along one and up two. Okay, so another way of looking at that is, um, this, this way works all the time, if you go along um, one unit, i.e. what you can do is you can divide this um, number by two to make it one, then you have to scale the triangle down the same way by dividing this by two, the same number, then you'll have going along one, and whatever this answer is here, in this case is two, is your gradient. So we now know the gradient is two, and if I have a look at the question, and I've moved things around a little bit, we know here the gradient from our best efforts, the gradient is two, but you might get something different if you tried it. And I think on the mark scheme, you are allowed to have something between um, 1.6 and I think it was um, 2.5. I can't be definitely sure on that. So you've got quite a big um, leeway there. So give that question a try with pencil and paper and see what you um, come up with. Question 21. The diagram shows three identical circles inside a rectangle. Um, the diagram's shown, and it says each circle touches the other two circles and the size of the rectangle. Um, okay, and it says the radius of each circle is 24 millimetres. We've got to work out the area of the rectangle. Well, the first thing I notice here is that if I make the radii look like this, then this is 24 millimetres, this is another 24, and of course it'll be another 24 here, and then another 24 here. So on the calculator or in your head, four 24s, that is 96 millimetres this way. So the next thing is, is to probably align your radii so we have a situation like so. So we have another 24, another 24 here, and then we've got a 24 here. And then what we can do is we can try and use Pythagoras to find this length here. And then all we have to do is add another 24 here, which would be the same as this length, and then another 24 here. So I think what we should try and find out is the value of x. And all we've got to do is add 48 to that value. Well, on the calculator, if we did um, Pythagoras, we'd have a triangle, um, the hypotenuse being 48, one of the other sides being 24, so we want 48 squared minus 24 squared and square root that, and that would be our value for x. So I'm going to do that on my calculator now. So we're going to have 48 squared minus 24 squared, and then I'm going to find the square root of that. And so my value of x is 41.56921938, giving everything on my calculator. And so I know that this length here, let's call it d, d is going to be, and I'll say approximately because this is rounded, that's going to be x plus 48, because don't forget we had to add these two values. So if I add 48 to that, that gives us um, d to be 89.56921938. Everything on my calculator display. So now to find the area of the rectangle, well that's just going to be the number on my calculator, um, given here, and I'm going to times that by 96. And so to three significant figures, I'll do that in a minute, so my area is going to be 8598.645061 millimeter squares, but I want it to three significant figures, 
So I'm going to look at the first three numbers here. And this 8 would change this 9 to a 10. So that would make this number go up by 1 because there's no room to write 10 here. I'd have to carry 1. So it would be 8,600 millimeter squares and I'm going to put 3 SF in brackets here. Question 22. We're given the first five terms of a sequence 4, 11, 22, 37 and 56. I'm going to try and do this um, with some understanding so if you want to fast forward you can jump using the right key on your keypad. Um, let's have a look. So if I call this T for the term and then we'll have N starts for the first, second, third, fourth and fifth term. I'm going to look at the differences. So difference 1 that goes up by 7 and then 11 and then 15 and then 19. The second difference is go up by 4 and that's a good thing because if they're all constant on the second difference then that will help us find what we need in terms of the coefficient of the squared term. Now don't get too worried about this but most of these sequences are not too bad if you understand this is the general form for a quadratic. Now a would have to be um, non-zero because if it was zero then you would just have a linear term like bn plus c. Okay, So we're going to have to find a, b and c. Now without going into too much detail, whenever you get to a second difference and it's constant, you always halve that and that will give you the value of A. Now I'd love to teach this right now, but I'm sure I'll get loads of complaints because they say that this will go on too long. So you just halve it. And once you've done that, you know that A has to be 2. So you know there's going to be a 2n squared going on. So you've already got that part. You know that's part of the solution. So what does 2n squared look like? Well, 2n squared means two lots of the square numbers. So if you know what um, the square numbers are, the first square number is 1, so if you double it to give 2n squared, that will be 2. 2 squared is 4, double it is 8. 3 squared is 9, double it is 18. 4 squared is 16, double is 32. And 5 squared is 25, double it, you get 50. Now what I would do is, I would then compare and see is that enough? We thought it was 2n squared, but we still need two more. So we can write down what we need. We need two more. Well, what do we need to get from 8 to 11? Well, we need three more. To get from 18 to 22, we need 4, 5, and 6. So the nice thing about this method is that once you know you've got 2n squared, that's never going to change, so you definitely know that's in the answer. But what does this sequence look like below the blue line? That's all we have to concentrate on. What is the sequence that goes 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? Well, this goes up in 1s straight away in the first difference. So we definitely know that it's going up in the 1 times table. So our value for b has to be 1. In fact, we don't even need to have to write the 1 in there. We just know it's going up in n. Because n, like I said, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But if we wrote the 1 times table underneath, which is what n is represented by, then we know that we still need to add 1 each time. So our value of c is 1. So our answer for 3 marks would be 2n squared plus n plus 1. And if you get a bit paranoid, you can check to see whether it would work. So you can put 5 in here. So let's just check it. 
5 squared is 25 times 2 is 50 plus 5 is 55 plus 1 is indeed 56. OK, so that's a short way of explaining this question. There's a lot more maths involved in this, but I'm not going to go into that right now. So I hope that gives you a bit of a heads up. Question 23. L is a circle with equation x squared plus y squared is 4. So if we do a pair of axes here, x and y, then we should know our circle formulae. Um, the general one is x squared plus y squared equals r squared, which is centred at 0, 0, radius r, not r squared. So here we've got r squared is 4, so the radius must be 2. So we basically want to draw a circle now around here, and that would have radius 2 in all directions. Now, we also know that this point is on the circle. So let's just say it was here. It doesn't really matter how our diagram is drawn, as long as it's roughly to scale. Now, you might ask yourself, well, how do I find an equation of the tangent to the circle at the point P, which is this point here? Well, this would be the equation of the tangent. And if you notice, the radius that goes through that point can be produced to form another straight line, and they would have to be at right angles, wouldn't they? Because a tangent and a radius, the circle property says that uh, a tangent is at 90 degrees to the radius. Okay, that's one of the circle theorems. So we can just find the equation, we can find the gradient, rather, um, of the, um, the line that goes through the radius. And the way we can do that is... And I think the easiest way to show you is that this coordinate was 3 over 2 along on the x and up by root 7 over 2. So if I want to find the gradient, that's for how far I go along. 1 is how far I go up. So if I go along 1.5, I go up by root 7 over 2. But if I divide both sides of this by 3 over 2, that makes this number going along 1. And whatever this number is going up here will be the gradient. Because a gradient always means if I go along one unit on the x-axis, whatever I go up or down by determines the gradient. And that's the quickest way of doing it that I find anyway. So I'm going to do this divided by um, 3 over 2 as well to scale it down. So my gradient, and I'll put gradient subscript r because it's the radius, is root 7 over 2 divided by 3 over 2, which, as you know, is root 7 over 2 times 2 thirds. These cancel. So we're left with root 7 over 3. So we know that if we want an equation to the tangent, then its gradient, I'll put m subscript t, must be the reciprocal of this number, but going the opposite way, so the sign will be negative. Because don't forget, if two tangents, sorry, if two lines are perpendicular, then their product of their gradients is always negative 1. Now, what we can do here is times top and bottom here by root 7 to rationalise the denominator. So this is m subscript t. Let's get this right. That would be minus 3 root 7 over root 7 times root 7 is just 7. So that's really nice. We've nearly got our straight line. What we can now do is say to ourselves, well, we know that y equals mx plus c. So we know our equation is y equals minus 3 root 7. And I'm going to put a hood around this 7 so we don't think it's around the x as well. Over 7. So that's the gradient, plus some intercept. And how are we going to find that? Well, the nice thing about this diagram is we know that this line has to go through the point P. So we know that when x is 3 over 2, y has to be root 7 over 2. So we can just substitute these values in and look what it will help us find. It will help us find the missing link, which is C. 
So when y is root 7 over 2, then we have x is 3 over 2. I'll put a bracket around that. Now let's cancel out some of these things if we can. <coughs> well, nothing to cancel, but we've got root 7 over 2 here. The 3 times the 3 is 9. And 7 times 2 is 14. And what we can do is we can then add this to this side here. I'm sorry, add this to both sides. Um, and what we would have is um, root 7 over 2 plus, because we add 9 root 7 over 14 to both sides, then we have 9 root 7 over 14 here equals C. If we get the denominators the same by times in top and bottom by 7, then what we'd have is 7 root 7 plus 9 root 7, which is 16 root 7, and the denominators match their 14ths. Now, what we can do here, this is even, so we can halve it. This is even, we can halve it, and we've got our final answer now. Because if we look back at our thing we wanted C, we've got it now. So y is going to be minus 3 root 7 over 7x plus 8 root 7 over 7. And another way of writing that would be um, minus 3 root 7 be careful with where you put the root sign, plus 8 root 7, and you can put it all over 7 if you want. There's many different ways of writing that straight line, um, but there's, um, there's two of them for you.